بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبيه الكريم وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد want to welcome all the students back to the continuation of our diploma program this is our fourth semester our second year we actually began our classes on sunday so our adab class began on sunday so we've met a lot of our students already and this is the beginning of our sira class and tomorrow we continue tafsir usul tafsir and sahih al bukhari so again all of our classes are in person and online um, so today we continue our sira journey the prior semester we completed the makkan sira with our sheikh ala saadawi so we covered all the events up until the planning of the hijra and the actual hijra itself so for this semester we are honored to begin continuing the journey into the medinan side of the sira and we are switching paces and switching pace slightly we have a new teacher and we're using a new book for this journey so we are honored to have with us imam rauf zaman who is no stranger to all of us and he's been a one of our advisors at the quran literacy institute in fact we formed the quran literacy institute under uh, his guidance and advice and we continue to benefit from him over the years and he has decided to retire and leave the state of new jersey and this is his final week and as we mentioned in the graduation we did honor him so all of you have an idea but alhamdulillah we are honored to have him continue teaching for us and the teaching will be online but being that he's here today we wanted to have the first session in person so this is the first session of the medina and sira and we're going to continue subsequently every wednesday at eight o'clock on zoom only and there will be nothing here on site so um the class will be roughly one hour instruction time from eight to nine every week and then we'll have QA. Um, and I think Imam Rauf agreed that throughout the sessions, um, when he finishes a section, he Assalamu alaikum. We can't hear online, I'm so sorry. Who are online, uh, those who are in the class here, yes, I can see. Um, uh, but uh, I want to start with a little bit of interaction first. Uh, uh, though, as uh, uh, Dr. Abu Zaid said, uh, I, I will normally be presenting for approximately an hour, maybe uh, less than that. Uh, but uh, if I fin finish a section, uh, then I'll uh, look at any questions that you may have. You, you may be able to ask, and we'll continue like that, uh, inshallah. So if you are saying uh, the slide that I have, <clears throat> which is ba a basic PDF that I prepared actually for myself, uh, not really uh, for students, because it has some very, very basic notes to remind me of, uh, you know, how to proceed uh, for today's session. 
Uh, but I want to start uh, with uh, asking you, and if you're able to answer, let me get some quick answers, uh, not necessarily from every from everyone, but uh, anyone who wishes to answer. Uh, so what's the aim of uh, studying history? Of course, Sira is part of history, right? So what's the aim of studying history and Sira in particular? Uh, any answers? Um, uh, you can go ahead. Uh, uh, any answers here in class? <laughs> What's the aim of studying history or uh, Sira in particular? Yes. So, again, using context as to why we do what we do, we don't study Sira for the arts of the everyday religion. Okay, so it gives us, con as Muslims, it gives us co a context of what we do and why we do it. Um, uh, it stares our, uh, our thinking, our understanding in relation to the deen. So, any other, uh, any other answers? Uh, no word, and any, uh, I'm not sure if I can hear anybody online. I'm not sure, is yeah, it? Online, um, you can hear it. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm, uh, I don't have it in front of me, so I can't see the chats, right? So if you can, uh, if there are any uh, answers or uh, questions, whatever, questions and answers, both. <laughs> you, I don't know if I ask a question and you, uh, you uh, respond to me, or you have a question. Uh, or you have a comment, uh, perhaps. Uh, so, uh, if uh, at least in this session, if uh, Dr. Abu Zaid can read, you know, if there are any um, uh, any responses. Uh, but uh, these are questions for us to think about, not necessarily answer immediately. Uh, I'm just uh, helping you and all of us to focus on what we're about to do. <clears throat> so, why are you in particular studying the Sira? <clears throat> Uh, what is your aim? Uh, what are your intentions? You know, behind your study of the Sira, um, it might be, of course, a wider, uh, uh, a part of a wider program that you're doing. Uh, as I just uh, learned from what uh, Dr. Abu Zaid is saying, you uh, are the subjects that you you are studying. But in particular, the Sira, uh, well, what would be the benefit of that, um, uh, and the the intention behind studying the Sira? Uh, and both questions, the first and this one, are closely related because it's, it's your perspective, uh, which you should think about, and maybe you should think about that for any of the other subjects also. Why are you studying this? Uh, and we all know, like uh, the, the first uh, person who answered uh, said, you know, uh, it, it is to have, uh, uh, to develop our own perspective and to know why we are doing things and uh, what we are doing also. We are studying the Sira, which is the biography, the life history uh, of uh, perhaps, uh, you know, the, the most important person in history, uh, uh, the most important of all of the prophets or the greatest of all of, uh, all of the prophets. And uh, I don't want to go into, uh, you know, detailed uh, description of him. We all know his place. Uh, uh, we know we all have, you know, uh, or, or we know his place in our hearts and his place in Islam, his role uh, in Islam. So he is uh, the one that we have to follow. And if we don't know him, then we cannot follow him, uh, at least, uh, you know, to the best of our ability. Uh, if we know him deeply, we can follow him, uh, uh, you know, more and, uh, and more precisely, uh, uh, methodologically, you know, faithfully, we, we will be able to do that. Uh, uh, if we understood, you know, the way in which he did things, then we can try to adopt uh, those ways also. If we understood uh, the ways in which we, he handled uh, difficulties and problems, <coughs> maybe confrontations with the enemies and so on, uh, we would be able to adopt a, a similar approach. Uh, we always have to look at what is happening to us uh, as Muslims <coughs> in our society and in the world today. Uh, and see how we can benefit from the Sira, we, how we can take guidance uh, from the Sira uh, uh, in order to chalk out our own approaches uh, to our situations. Uh, uh, the two other questions I have, uh, uh, I have to try to keep this thing from shutting down. <laughs> uh, what is the main emphasis uh, in the Maki phase? Uh, and what is the main emphasis in the Madani phase? Um, uh, and uh, so uh, again, you know, without going into details, uh, 
many of the scholars, perhaps most, if not all of the scholars uh, talk about the, when they talk about the Maki phase, uh, they talk about the foundations of Islam uh, and the foundations of Islam meant uh, the understanding of the Aqidah. Uh, and more than that, uh, the Aqidah is perhaps the, the most important thing that was taught in Mecca. Uh, but uh, there, there is much more than that. And I would perhaps summarize it in two, uh, Aqidah and Akhlaq. Uh, and we all know what the Aqidah is. I'm going to come back to that uh, in, a, uh, in a second. Uh, let me see this. Take a, a, a little... Okay. Uh, well, so uh, I'm going to come back a, a, a bit to the Aqidah. Uh, but uh, where do you find Akhlaq in the uh, Maki phase? Uh, all over, right? All over. From the very beginning, uh, Muslims uh, were learning to be proper Muslims, upright Muslims. And so there was a lot of emphasis on the Akhlaq, including in those verses. Uh, that are Madini or Maki verses, rather, the Maki surahs of the Quran. There's a lot of stress and emphasis on uh, the akhlaq, apart from the aqidah. So I think that those are the two emphases uh, that the Maki phase had. Uh, but when we talk about aqidah, which is like belief in Allah, belief in the messengers, and in particular the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, summarized uh, in, uh, in the Shahadatain. So belief in Allah, acknowledging the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and acknowledging that Muhammad is a messenger of Allah. Um, <clears throat> it is not just uh, emphasizing, uh, you know, uh, it, it is not just a matter of, uh, well, it is a matter of belief, uh, but uh, what is mentioned in the Shahadatain is our acknowledgement of him as Rasul. So he was bringing, bringing a message to us, a risala to us, uh, which is very important. He was not just Nabi. He was not just maybe preaching about uh, the basics of beliefs and so on, but he was bringing uh, an entire system to us. Uh, and he was not just uh, a messenger, a Rasul, but he was also the, the last, the final uh, messenger. Walakin Rasul Allahi wa khataman nabiyyin. Uh, he was uh, the seal of the prophets, uh, which uh, means also the seal of messengers, because the messengers are a subsection of the of the prophets. Uh, so, uh, uh, so him being a seal of prophets uh, means uh, uh, that he was also the seal of all of the messengers. After him, there is no new messenger to come. Uh, so he would have completed the message. Uh, so from the very beginning of the, when we, we utter the shahadatain, that's what we are saying. Uh, and uh, the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his oneness and the belief in Muhammad alayhi salatu as the messenger of Allah and the final messenger uh, are uh, extremely important for us to understand. These are <clears throat> the foundation, the aqidah foundations uh, of uh, the Maki phase. However, it, it is... Uh, uh, you know, it leads into something practical, uh, especially uh, the ibadat, our worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all, all its forms, the understanding in, in its more, most comprehensive way of what ibadah is, uh, and that ibadah is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. He said he wants chicken. Uh, this is the issue that uh, Islam has with all other religions, all other systems of life. Uh, they have but other things and other gods and so on that they are worshipping. Uh, and uh, of course, there is only one God and only one being that is worthy of worship. So that is the declaration that we make in the Shahadatain. And Muhammad salatu wasalam, uh, was speaking on behalf of uh, that one God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so everything that came out of his mouth is the truth. And that is something that he said himself. You know, people have a misunderstanding, including many Muslims, have a misunderstanding of what the Sunnah and what, uh, what is Hadith. Um, while we can't go into details because uh, that's another study, you know, the Ulum uh, Hadith and so on is another study. Uh, but uh, uh, this, uh, the, the, uh, we must understand at least uh, basically that, uh, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
uh, actually one of the Sahaba was writing things that he said, that he heard from the Prophet uh, And then others uh, objected to it. Others, you know, maybe discussed it with him and told him not to do that because the Prophet Sallallahu he was a human being and so things can come out of his mouth uh, that uh, are not necessarily to be recorded. Uh, uh, and so he came, and this was Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to tell him about that and ask his guidance. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, right, for everything that comes out of my mouth is the truth. Uh, that's a very, very important state, statement. Everything that comes out of the mouth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the truth. It is guidance for us all. Uh, it is, uh, you know, important uh, for our way of living. It is important to understand the entire Islamic system. We cannot do without it. Just as we cannot do without the Quran, we cannot do also without the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So everything in the Sunnah is guidance for us, no matter who says what and who thinks otherwise, right? Uh, there are you know muslims who will argue uh, with that point uh, saying that the sunnah or the hadith is not re reliable but we won't uh, you know um, have an entire discussion on that uh, the other uh, teaching uh, in the mccafe are part of the teaching of aqidah but one that is highlighted also in the especially in the mccafe but throughout when you uh, uh, and that is uh, belief in the akhirah uh, you will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very often saying, uh, you know, uh, talking about those who believe in Allah and the last day. Those who believe in Allah and the last day. Right? So that is repeated over and over because of the emphasis on belief in the last day. Uh, this is something that uh, the Arabs in the days of Jahiliya doubted. How can we be resurrected when we are all rotten, our bones and our flesh, everything rotten and so on? who will bring us back to life, etc. A lot of questions they asked the Prophet uh, in this regard. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the answer to that in the Quran. Say the one who created them in the first place, their bones and your flesh, uh, will revive them. He's the one, he has the power, he created you in the first place. Uh, so when we go on to the uh, Madani phase, uh, uh, what is the main emphasis? And I want to bring this up front uh, so that uh, when we're discussing some of the details, of course, we can discuss all of the details. This, everything that happened to him, everything that he said and so on, is a guidance. You, uh, uh, as I earlier uh, said, right? So everything can be examined and should be actually examined. Practice it also in the way that it should be practiced. Uh, so his entire life and every single thing about him, what the Sahaba observed about him and so on, Everything about him is guidance for us. So nothing is unimportant in the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so, uh, but not just uh, for, uh, while it's important for all Muslims, especially the du'at. And who are the du'at? Of course, du'at is the plural of the word da'iya or, or da'i, uh, which means uh, one who calls to Islam, one who invites people to work. Or. The Islamic workers must have the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uppermost in their mind always. And they must always be searching their mind. You know, a lot of things about the seerah and about the life of the Prophet Sallallahu should be in our minds. Our minds, we don't have to, we should not have to be going to the books all the time to see what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did, but we should have it in our minds. And so we should try to recollect, re recollect if uh, some uh, with the various situations that he encountered. Uh, so uh, we must have uh, his example, you know, in front of our eyes all the time. You know, uh, you know, uh, at least, you know, you know, uh, in a sort of, uh, you know, in our mind, we should have that. We we should have that. We should have him. We should be seeing him all the time in every situation, uh, and thinking of what he would do, how he would answer a, a question, how he would deal with uh, opposition, and so on and so. Uh, there was no way uh, for the Muslims uh, like to build, uh, you know, a complete uh, community because of the kind of opposition uh, that was there. They could not come out into the open to practice Islam, etc. Of the concentration was on the building of individuals, uh, people who came uh, uh, into Islam, people who were attracted to Islam. Uh, to give them that uh, strong foundation of uh, the aqidah the, the uh, and the akhlaq also to the extent that I would know from that maki phase 
uh, when he and a group of other Muslims migrated uh, to Abyssinia, and he, he was uh, chosen to be the representative and he had to speak to the Negus of Abyssinia, uh, the king of Abyssinia, and what was their mission and so on. What did he do? Most of what he said, a lot of what he said, if you go back to that speech, I don't have it in front of me to quote it now, but you could go back to that. Maybe it was quoted and discussed uh, in uh, the Maki discussions that you would have, classes that you would have had. Uh, in that, uh, he talked about the akhlaq that were changed, that the Prophet Sallallahu was calling to, uh, uh, and they were involved in that until this messenger came and uh, you know brought them out of that. Uh, from darkness uh, into light. But he also emphasized uh, the belief in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, even zakah uh, and uh, saum and so on. Uh, uh, but uh, we know that uh, these things were not you know, uh, fully detailed uh, in the Maki phase, but yet uh, they were already established uh, in a way, in a rudimentary way, you might say, short speech, relatively short speech that he gave to the uh, Negus and the, uh, of, uh, of Abyssinia and the other you know, important people within, uh, the, within the palace. Uh, 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 not just aqidah and the correctness of it, but what comes out of aqidah, uh, the ibadat, uh, and also the akhlaq, you know, this practical way of living of Muslims. And even if they're alone, but also when they're interacting with people, what they show, their akhlaq, uh, their morals and manners and character and so on should be. So in Mecca, it was the building of the Muslim individual uh, and the foundations of the Islamic community, the foundations. Of course, when, uh, when they could, you know, uh, they were meeting with the Prophet وسلم, and learning from him, you know, until until uh, things came out in the open. And then uh, the, when difficulties started, perhaps they could not meet uh, at all and they could not, you know, preach Islam openly. Uh, and, you know, they, they had to remain in hiding until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided a way out for them to migrate uh, to Medina. So uh, the emphasis on the building of the individual. Why? Um, uh, and when we compare the Makki phase with the Madani phase, equally important. There are many people who will say that the Madani phase uh, of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of his da'wah is more important than the Maki phase uh, because all of the laws were set in Medina and, uh, and uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, was able to you know, establish not just a Muslim community but what many would call an Islamic state uh, with all of the rules and regulations. The, uh, uh, the, the emphasis the, uh, uh, was different was the building of the, com the community or the Islamic society in Medina, rules and regulations, etc. While in Mecca, it was the building of the individual and his commitment to Islam, his full understanding of Islam and his uh, commitment to all of that. Uh, and commitment, of course, was shown by his ibadah, his worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as well as his dis And by the way, um, you know, Jafar uh, uh, and the, the people who migrated with him uh, to Abyssinia, how long within the Makki phase was that? It was, you know, very, not very long. It's not at the end of the Makki phase, it was very early. Right in the in the Maki phase, so representatives of that, and when they went to uh, to Abyssinia, they were calling to that already. I mean, they were telling people about that. This is what we stand for. Uh, so, a uh, uh, free Islamic worker. Uh, so, uh, and some of the scholars, uh, Maududi and others, right, uh, talk about these three aspects of the Aqidah, Tawheed, Risala, and Akhirah. So we we'll go go past and the importance of it. We talked about uh, the, uh, what is Akhlaq doing good to others, refraining from harm to self and to others. So your, your own self and making sure that you are developing that and so on. You know, part of, so let's move on. Uh, so in Medina, the building of Islamic, uh, an Islamic society or the, Islam, the model Islamic society uh, and the building of the Islamic state uh, that uh, can, you know, uh, that represents Islam, that goes out, meets uh, other, uh, other societies, other states, interacts with them on, a, uh, uh, on an equal basis. You know that that is what was established, and nobody could have thought, you know, when you go, when you were going through the mad and the, you know, just a small amount of people who had accepted Islam in the Maki phase, you could not have imagined that within ten years, an Islamic state would be established that is on par with. And the Prophet was interacting with them and sending letters to them and so on, you know, as a head of state, and inviting them to Islam, inviting them to our way of life. You know, when we talk, when we think about what is the role of an Islamic state, what really you know, uh, what is the what are the characteristics of an Islamic state? Uh, what is the Islamic state supposed to be doing? What's its role, and so on? How does it responsibilities, etc.? It's a very, very deep study, but I'm just touching it so we understand what we're getting into. That is what the Prophet ﷺ was established those ten years, just ten years. Uh, was this possible? Did this ever happen in uh, you know with any other state in the world? Think of any other state, whether they're the Romans or the Greeks or the, the in the, in the world at that time or before that, and how uh, you know uh, how long did it take to be established, uh, and also how long did it take for them to crumble? They crumbled very quickly. Most of them crumbled very very quickly. Uh, 
but this by the Prophet So you know, today, uh, well, uh, I, I, you know, you know, in the last uh, maybe uh, decades uh, or the early decades of my life, <laughs> the Roman society or you know anything like that, right? The Roman state or Greek state or Egyptian, or, you know, anything like that. But these days, uh, more and more of that, unfortunately, is coming to the surface. That people want to do that, just as how they are doing and so on, right? Uh, there are people who uh, who look uh, to the, the the Romans and what they were doing, etc. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the world today is very very complicated. Uh, but uh, for a long while, no nobody wanted to revive them. But the Islamic community, Islamic society, is different. Muslims always have the thought of living in an Islamic state. You may say, or Islamic society. I say here, Maki and Madani, we cannot separate the two. One follows from the other. If we think that we can isolate. The, Ma the Madani phase uh, from the Makki phase and say we don't need to look at the Makki phase so much. We just look at the Madani phase and how things developed and all of the, the important foundation of Islam. Right? So uh, uh, now, so Madina play is a place where uh, where Islam could be strong, practice. Uh, it can be practiced openly. Uh, all others uh, to Islam and so on. That is what was established. Uh, so uh, uh, let us uh, <clears throat> talk about what happened when the Prophet ﷺ first entered Medina. A good time for us to take a, a, a short break, well not break, but uh, uh, for answer, for questions, uh, answers, even comments, if you have any comment too. So I'll begin with the first question then. Um, these are deep issues, as you mentioned, about the Islamic State. So, you know, there's there's a lot of discussion about, you know, what happened, the Prophet ﷺ. So there's a lot of discussion, where does that fall into, like in terms of like the Islamic conception and goals and, was the state a incidental byproduct as it were created where they could establish Islam? Or was it something that was purposeful and it was a goal? Um, and it was something that required strategy and planning. And if it was a goal, then is it something, where does it fall in the Sharia? Or is it like to worship? So what kind of clarity can you give us on those issues? It can be a very long discussion on this matter, but uh, a short answer is, uh, for, at least for me, um, from my readings of the Sira, Uh, and, you know, uh, very often he waited for revelation to come uh, to give an answer to questions uh, or to give guidance on, on the situation and how to act. You might think that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was uh, being shown the way, you know, as things happened, uh, the guidance was coming to him, the revelation was coming to him, uh, and that very often he did not perhaps know what is the era. It's in hindsight, hindsight of course, right? Uh, when we put it, everything in perspective. Everything had a purpose behind it, uh, and we, we will see that everything that was established in the phases uh, of the Madani period uh, are very important for us today also. So what was established, I talked about that, I mean, the, uh, the Islamic workers do not have that foundation, then they cannot uh, take Islam, they, they will fail. Uh, and those who are, are trying to put maybe the, the, the card, uh, the state, we have to establish an Islamic state, but they don't pay attention to the foundations, what are the correct foundations? You know of uh, of the Islamic State, uh, they miss the mark uh, tremendously. They can end up failing. Uh, so there are some recent you know att attempts in, in our life in the last uh, decade or a couple of decades or so. You know you have um, uh, well the Taliban, but then you know they're back again. And Allahu Alam, we maybe make du'a for them uh, that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will show them the right way and en enable them to establish a proper you know Islamic State. Without uh, emphasis on those uh, proper foundations, and so they did not last for very long, at least in the first phase. And then there was the, you know, uh, I, I, I says, uh, I, I, uh, uh, what are the established state, and uh, the, you know, eventually crashed, right? They eventually crashed, and maybe the foundations were not there, and perhaps, of course, the, the correct understanding of Islam perhaps was not there, uh, and so on. Uh, but the, the the steps that need to be. Uh, so when we when we look at all of that and we compare, you know, what even what is happening today and what happened in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and we look keenly at, you know, how he did things, uh, we see that everything is pur purposeful. Uh, but uh, I don't know if there are any, any other questions. I'm not sure if I answer all, you know, it, uh, I think we're here or online. Okay. That's yeah. um, all. Right? They were unable to retain even one quote from him because they didn't have a state. And then the Romans came in and they just destroyed all their manuscripts and, you know, basically hijacked the religion and made it into, you will lose your identity. 
you will not be able to preserve your knowledge. You will not be able to preserve even the name of your Prophet, which is what happened to the previous generation. They don't even know the name of Isa alayhi salam. Imagine that. Mm -hmm. So I think in order to present and protect... Uh, yeah, the point is understood, of course, uh, this can be argued. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and then when we look back into history, we see that uh, uh, there were maybe only two Prophets who headed uh, a state. And of course, uh, Dan alayhi salam. You know, in, so in the time, the whole history of Bani Israel, that was the time, the glorious time, you know, the golden time for Bani Israel, when the prophets were the, you know, the heads of state. And so that's a very deep, uh, you know, discussion. Uh, so when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi entered into, uh, into Medina, well, first of all, he stopped in Quba, uh, and he established a masjid in Quba. It was just established, the foundations were in Medina proper. On the way, he stopped and prayed and so on, and he established a masjid there. Masjid was established in that place where he prayed. And then when he came to Medina proper, he established the great Masjid, a Masjid of Nabawi, right? Uh, so this alone shows the importance of the Masjid. Uh, so from the very beginning of the Madani period, the Nabawi, and then when we look at the role that the Masjid of Nabawi played, uh, we'll see the importance of the centrality of that for the life of Muslims. Um, there was a Masjid before. In fact, there were two masjids uh, before Masjid al Haram and uh, Masjid al Aqsa. Those were there, but uh, were they playing their role? Uh, both uh, of them were in the hands of the kuffar, the disbelievers, right? Uh, al Masjid al Haram uh, in Mecca and then al Masjid al Aqsa in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, in Quds. So uh, none of them could uh, play uh, the role that uh, they shared in, uh, in Mecca. Uh, and you will see the, the unique way in which uh, he, uh, he chose the site. He himself did not cho choose the site. Uh, and, you know, of course, you should be reading. And by the way, that book by uh, Sabai, Mustafa Sabai, uh, in English, uh, The Life of uh, the Prophet Muhammad, Highlights and Lessons. Highlights and Lessons, that's how it is translated. Durus uh, Aibar, Durus, Highlights and Lessons. Uh, so he, did, he gives uh, you know, some facts uh, in history uh, very briefly, he goes through a, a large period of the, of the Sira. And then he extracts a lot of lessons from it. While I, while uh, you know, and, and study, it's a very, very good book uh, and a very good approach to the Sira. Uh, however, uh, I'm not uh, confining myself to that. I'm using other resources uh, for us to have a deeper understanding of uh, the Sira. So, you know, everybody wanted to be the host of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they wanted to pull his camel towards uh, their ma'mura. Uh, it is an uh, order commanded by Allah subhanahu wa taala. And then the camel went to an empty lot and sat down there. And he said, this is our home. This is where we're going to be. To sell uh, that land, uh, sorry, they offered to give him that land, to gift it to him. But he refused to take it as a gift and he bought it from them. Uh, and there are many, there are important lessons from that. If you, as I said, every to be very, very small, but all of them have huge lessons in them. Why did the Prophet sell this, uh, buy it from them? You know, he, did, uh, he wanted to establish this masjid, not his home. I mean, this is our home, the masjid is our home. It to be, you know, in such a way that every, it will accommodate everyone. Uh, no one will have an advantage over the other. And that is perhaps why also he did not uh, 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 just accept the invitation from anyone. He decided that uh, he will have a place that he's going to establish. Uh, 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 and that is where he is going to be. So it was bought, uh, you know, there were some date palms on it, some graves of, of Mushrikeen. Uh, some old buildings and so on. All of these things were cleared uh, for in its construction, in the construction of the masjid. Uh, so the Sahaba uh, helped in all of the clearing of the land, etc., and then the building of the masjid. And they were, you know, bringing all of all of, all of the material from wherever they could find it uh, in order to, to construct the masjid. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam participated with them. You know, all of this is very important. Uh, you know, the when you work together, when the Islamic asks uh, together, then they build a strong relationship between themselves. They, on, they, get, they get to understand each other better. They get to know each other better. They get to know each other's skills and so on. Uh, they get to know the sincerity of each other. They get to, you know, they cooperate with each other. They're able to help each other and so on. So these are things that uh, we must continue to do. There must be projects that they do have relationships with, with, uh, with each other and you get to know each other uh, deeply. You cannot work for Islam unless you know each other very deeply, right? You cannot really work for Islam. How can you establish an Islamic society and you don't know the people? So uh, this uh, meaning both the Ansar and the Muhajirin. Uh, <clears throat> and the Prophet participated with them. And that's an important fact. Also, the leader, the leadership must be part of the people. He tells them what to do and he's not with them. Uh, that is not the kind of leadership that we should have in Islam, right? The, the, uh, the leader is in front uh, with them in the struggle and everything, right? Uh, so and we'll see that, uh, that in Mecca. And you'll see this continuously in Medina also. Uh, so the Prophet was uh, with them all the way. 
And when they were chanting, you know, during the construction, they were, you know, uh, chant about the guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to them and he has made them brothers and so on. Uh, the Prophet was with them, although, you know, the man that says that, uh, uh, that he did not, uh, he did not speak poetry. So he did not act, you know, he was saying just to, you know, spar them on. And so because uh, that's an important way, you know, of, um, of making the task easy, making the work easy when you're doing it, you know, with, uh, with uh, and then there was uh, the, this individual Talq Ibn Ali al-Yamami from Yemen, and he was killed in mixing the soil and some, maybe the cement, whatever they were using. And when they encouraged him to do that, and not only that, but he encouraged him to specialize in it. And so from the very beginning, we see that the Prophet sent him several things about him. He was watching the people. He was observing the events that they had. Because these skills that everyone has, we have different skills, but all of these skills can be very useful for Islamic work. If they are understood and if the skills are utilized, then you can bring the people together, they can do the work together, and so on. Each one of them is contributing you know, his skill to the whole project, uh, and uh, they're able to accomplish, accomplish that you know, with the least uh, difficulty because you have the skills and they're showing it, at, and encouraging people to specialize uh, in the areas that they excelled in. After the building of the masjid, uh, the apartments were built uh, around it for his wives, especially on, uh, in, in one direction. Um, uh, did not, uh, maybe one wife, and uh, the, you know, of course, uh, Khadija radiallahu anha had died uh, in the Maki phase. Uh, Umar um, um, Salama, I think it was, um, you know, the, you know, first and then the others, he married others and so on. So perhaps gradually, you know, whenever he married again, uh, you know, a new apartment was established for him and all of these were connected to the masjid. So the Prophet and so on, very closely connected to the masjid. Uh, it's important for the leadership uh, to be perhaps in, in a sense Perhaps many people don't think of it, but we should think of it. He could have had a palace by himself. At that time, everybody accepted him. All of the Ansar, all of the Muhajirin, you know, were, were there with him and so on. And he could have just said to them, I need a palace, right? Uh, you know, build. Uh, I'm going to marry many wives and so on. So I need to have a huge establishment for myself. But he didn't. It was a masjid that, uh, that you know, was important. Just, uh, very, very small, uh, very basic uh, uh, amenities uh, in, in them and so on. So, uh, you know, uh, and then there's so, so much uh, we could elaborate on, but every point that we make, we just, uh, you know, touch on it briefly and, uh, and then move on. The next thing, okay, now the masjid, uh, uh, and then they decide, well, we need to have a way of calling uh, or announcing that it is time for prayer. Of course, uh, at the end of the, uh, uh, at the end of the Makki phase, uh, the five did it to be established just, just at the end of the Makki phase and into Medina. So now that they have the opportunity uh, with, with no one to stop them and no one to molest them and so on, and now that the masjid is built, they can come uh, very easily to the masjid, pray with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, listen to him, etc. You know, take, uh, so they started to come to the masjid, but how can they remember? They, they, they're busy, you know, they work in their, in their farms or whatever, their, their date farms and so on. Uh, how can uh, a suggestion I mean, you know, the Jews have the horn that they blow. Uh, the Prophet did not like that. The Christians have their bell. And up to today, of course, both of them have these, uh, these things, right? The, the horn and the bell. And again, this is, a, this is something important that the Prophet established from the beginning of the Ma Ma Maki, uh, sorry, Madani period. You know, in the whole of the Maki period, there was emphasis on the Prophets and understanding who they were. And most of those Prophets are from Bani Israel. Uh, the prophets that the Jews and the Christians recognize, and many of them are mentioned in the in the book. Are more prophets, and that I mentioned in the uh, in the books also. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, we 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 were we, we were taught in the Maki phase that you know the prophets are we should believe in them, we should follow them. You know, we have to see what they did and live our lives in accordance with that, and so on and so forth. Right? They are the ones who are upright. They are the ones who you know are good, and so on. Um, but uh, you know. Because of the differences between us uh, and the Jews and Christian, Bani Israel on, on the whole, and uh, these two factions of them, uh, the Prophet said, uh, from the very beginning, want to follow them. We don't want to follow them. We should do things, even if they are similar, differently than them. So the way that we call people to prayer should be different. You know, they discussed, uh, uh, he could take suggestions from people. This is not revelation. He didn't have revelation concerning it, right? 
uh, listen to what they say, Partici help them to participate, you know, give them an opportunity within the Muslim community. What ideas do you have for uh, calling uh, the people to prayer, telling them that the time is there? And so they went home perhaps in the night, sleeping over it and so on. And then Abdullah ibn next day to the Prophet and said, I saw the Adhan in a dream. I'm not going through you know, the whole thing, all, all of the details of that dream. But basically, he saw the Adhan, the words of the Adhan and so on. And he told that the idea, this is, you know, inshallah, is what is pleasing, will be pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we'll do this. Uh, and then the Prophet said, selected Bilal radiallahu anhu as the first Mu'addin. Why did he not ask Abdullah ibn, ibn Zayd to be the first? Uh, he said that, uh, tell Bilal, these words that he can call the Adhan, uh, Bilal and the Saud and Mink. Uh, he is uh, more maybe beautiful in, in his voice than you. Uh, so that establish, uh, establishes who the Mu'addin should be. He should, of course, know the words properly and he should be able to call it in a nice voice and so on, in a loud voice. And that uh, can also have the meaning. Uh, <clears throat> so Bilal was selected. And then when uh, Omar radiallahu an, who heard it for the first time, he came running and he said, I saw it in a dream also. I saw it in a dream. But, uh, you know, some uh, the, uh, throughout uh, Mecca and Medina, both, in both phases, uh, the scholars tried something. The first Sahabi who had the, you know, the privilege, uh, who was maybe appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do something first before everybody else. So Abdullah, the Adhan in a dream. Uh, so everybody had a distinction. Many of the Sahabi had a distinction of being the first in something, but Omar missed this opportunity. <laughs> he was busy and so on and he forgot it. Uh, but then he remembered uh, when he heard it. So, and then when we, uh, the words of the Adhan, I'm not going into all the words, but all of it is so important. Uh, but just the, the beginning of it, right? Allahu Akbar, which we all know, which has become uh, something that, that scares the disbelievers. <laughs> Allahu Akbar, right? Uh, you know what, we know what happens, right? You have to be careful of how you're saying that, right? Allahu Akbar would start, to, would start a big scare among people. But that is the, but it, that, the slogan, this, this is the, you know, the, the shout, the, the call that we have, Allahu Akbar. You know, important, okay, it is a phrase that also summarizes what it really means, Allah, you know, uh, and uh, how we should always be, be considering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his words, etc. Whatever comes, whatever guidance comes from him, Allahu Akbar, whatever situation, with Allahu Akbar, etc. So this phrase is so important. Some people <laughs> who, uh, they might not even be Muslim in a crowd, <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Uh, so... So it's a phrase that we need to understand deeply. It's you know, such a deep part of Islam, Islamic teachings. Uh, then after 17 months uh, in Medina, came the change of Qibla. The Prophet ﷺ wanted to, to turn to the first Qibla, uh, of course, uh, al Masjid al-Haram. Uh, and when he was in Mecca, uh, he would put himself in such a position that he would face uh, the al Masjid al-Haram and at the same time al Masjid al-Aqsa. So he would be south to the north because al Masjid al-Aqsa is in the north. So he'll be able to face both, both, both masjids at the same time. But since uh, uh, the Medina is in the north of Mecca, when he came to Mecca, he could not do that any longer of you know, the recent prophets before him. So that is what he was facing. Uh, but he wanted, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indicated that, you know, I know uh, what is going on, I, what, what you want, to, and so you want to face instruction that he and the Muslims uh, should turn their faces towards al masjid al-Haram. So 17, after months, uh, 17 months after the masjid was established, or 17 months uh, in, in Medina, uh, the Qibla was changed. Uh, so the Prophet could no longer face uh, al masjid al-Aqsa. He had to own. Uh, there are many things that came out of, uh, out of that situation. Uh, uh, one uh, of it uh, is uh, that uh, the problem with the Jews uh, became uh, there, there are several things that you know we have to be going back and forth a little bit right uh, in this especially in, in this early period uh, in terms of what was happening a number of things that were happening um, uh, and, and um, I see it's nine o'clock already so you you tell me when <laughs> I need <laughs> when I need to stop right? uh, uh, but, uh, maybe we can you know we can continue uh, we can continue we'll perhaps need to continue this but let me uh, so the things that we'll go into a bit more. Uh, so that is one thing, the change of the Qibla uh, and, uh, and what happened, you know, what it caused within the Medina society. Uh, then there is the brotherhood that the Prophet Sallam established among the Ansar and the Muhajirin that uh, when people came into Medina, you know, the early Muslims, especially those who came before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were able to settle into Medina uh, uh, and, uh, you know, without much problems. But those who came afterwards, 
you know, the, and some so the late comers, you know, were having more difficulties. And uh, uh, what uh, the, the provincial asylum established to solve this problem, you have you have uh, you know an inflow of refugees. Say, you know, let's use that term because we are familiar with that term today. An inflow of refugees coming in for the entire ten years. But in particular, those who left after the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, uh, and the difficulties that they had. Uh, so, how did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi solve uh, that matter? And can there be uh, lessons in it for us also in the refugee problem uh, problems that are there in the world today? Most most of them. Uh, and also, the people were disparate, right? They were uh, different. They came from different backgrounds uh, and different tribes. And tribe, you know, the tribe was uh, uh, the important. Thing. Uh, in Mecca, you know, and all over the Arabian Peninsula, the tribe was an important thing, right? Uh, so how do you uh, wean people away from the allegiance to tribe uh, into allegiance uh, to Islam and bring them together, unite them uh, as brothers, uh, unite them as Muslims and so on? There's a lot of challenges. You know, don't think, you know, sometimes we read through the seerah very quickly and we don't think about this matter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, In Surah, uh, Surah uh, Ali Imran, By his blessing, by his Grace, uh, you became brothers uh, to each other. So this was a huge uh, factor to think uh, alike and to think for each other uh, and so on. Uh, so we'll discuss that a bit more uh, uh, later, in, you know, next session, inshallah. Uh, you know, and today the question, we have friendship <laughs> with the Kufar and so on, maybe you know, this concept of uh, what, what it means to be brothers with another Muslim, but, uh, you know, friends with the Kufar and so on, you know, is that possible? Uh, and then there's a the case of Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, uh, Salman al Farisi, and so some unique situations. Uh, unique situations uh, which. Uh, uh, so, uh, that this point uh, we look at later. And the other thing was the process and established a constitution from it, or what is sometimes known as the Pact of Man. Again, apart from the Muslims who were coming from different backgrounds. Uh, there were also different types of people in Medina. Medina consisted of uh, uh, the, uh, the Ansar, first of all, the Aus and the Khazraj, which were at war with each other before the coming of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that's a... Uh, the other group of Muslims who came from other places and especially Mecca, uh, and you know how to make all of them into one community all of these different groups of muslims uh, people coming from different uh, also you had the non-muslims among them the two uh, in medina the mushriks from the house and khazraj who had not accepted islam they uh, immediately did not accept islam so there were mushriks uh, from the house and khazraj until eventually all of them accepted islam so uh, so the house and khazraj became you know completely muslim uh, after a period of time uh, in medina the uh, so how the Prophet uh, dealt with those Mushriks to understand the terms, right? Uh, who was a Mushrik. And then there were the Jews who were three tribes in Medina. Uh, and uh, they had alliances uh, with uh, the Aus and the Khazraj and you know, many things about them. They were well established in Medina. In fact, they even had their own Dina. Um, uh, uh, you know, we looked at uh, we looked parallels uh, in our world today, right? Um, you know, how uh, and uh, they uh, uh, had a lot of the concept, a lot of the teachings and so on. They believed in prophets. Uh, they believed in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so on and so forth. Uh, so the Aqidah, a lot of it uh, was, was the same, but ne nevertheless, they were a separate people. Uh, and the reason why they remained a separate people is because uh, they did not alam, they did not say the Shahadatain in its uh, entirety, right? Uh, so, uh, and they, from the very beginning, uh, show, started to show hostility. Uh, so that's a, a situation also that you know in the early part of Medina and developed uh, uh, a huge uh, problem uh, within uh, Medina. Uh, you know, and you know how to bring all of these people together, all of the different people who are uh, inhabitants of Medina together, uh, and uh, you know establish them uh, as one. Uh, the reasons for saying uh, that uh, the Prophet Adam was very clear-minded about what he was going to do, what he was doing. Right. Uh, so from the very beginning, you see that the things that he established. Uh, what was uh, so uh, the pact of Medina or the constitution of Medina that was established that included all of these different groups of people so even including not just the Muslims and the different groups of Muslims but the different uh, Mushrikeen who came from the different tribes and so on and uh, the Jews who were different tribes themselves together and uh, enable them uh, uh, to uh, you know push them towards considering themselves all part of one society one state all together working for a common good uh, working to, for the preservation of Medina and so on and so forth. 
later on, uh, not immediately, uh, but uh, perhaps early in the Medinan phase also the, the emergence of the hypocrites. Uh, so that's a matter, as we go along, we'll, we'll also talk about them uh, out there in Mecca at all. There were no hypocrites in, in Mecca among the Muslims. This is a phenomenon that started in Medina, why it started, what happened with them and so on, and can there be lessons that we get into the audit that perhaps we can examine. Uh, so some of the, uh, and then after all of that, that's a lot of discussion you can see there uh, that is already there for our next session. Uh, things like the preparation of a Muslim, uh, of an army in many phases, such as the battles and the treaties and so on. Uh, and we look at the growth and expansion of Islam until it became a state that is recognized uh, by other states outside. So maybe if there are any final questions, uh, both online or, or in the class here. Anyone online have questions, just feel free to type them to the audience. So with the, um, the, the Abdul Rahman ibn Awf and Salman al-Farisi, are we going to go over mm -hmm. that they had with the Kuffar? Yeah, they are brotherhood, but the, uh, you know, they are the brotherhood. And a few things, I'm just, just to illustrate the concept of what the brotherhood really means, right? Uh, so, of course, there are many others. And, uh, early in Medina, you can see the, this, uh, the establishment of this uh, Mu'akha, you know, the brotherhood, the pairing of uh, 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 Ansari uh, with the Muhajiri, right? That pairing, and so on, is very, very well said that the Prophet Sallam made him a brother with such and such Ansari and so on. What others report is that the Prophet Sallam gathered them all together, maybe in the masjid or wherever, right? And he paired them off, right? One Mahaj. And some of the things, um, you know, I have this point here. Uh, I can quickly go back to it, uh, uh, where, uh, uh, you know, it's a bit difficult to uh, move this slide up. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi to divide their plantations, that is, the dead plantations uh, uh, for them, you know, uh, after the brotherhood was established, right? And they wanted to share everything with the Muhajireen. This is what they answered, you know, the eight farms that they had. And they came to the Prophet and said, divide it up for us, right? And he said, no, I won't do that. Why? And he didn't want that to be sort of artificial, to be forced upon them and so on, right? So naturally, they, they themselves the plantations and we'll divide the profits of it, right? We'll give some of that, uh, you know, maybe half of it, whatever, right, uh, to the Muhajireen. Uh, so they worked on it together and they shared uh, the profits uh, that came out of it. That's a brotherhood that was established. Okay, so. Uh, that uh, uh, we may not, we won't have the time, of course, to go into that in there, that's to be done. Uh, but we'll see in the case of Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. Uh, that he was paired with one of the rich, uh, rich uh, uh, Ansaris. Right? He himself was very uh, was a rich person. Uh, well, just to give you the story I wanted to mention, right? uh, this, uh, this Ansari, who is a brother now, says, I'm rich, I'm a rich person, you can have half of my wealth. Uh, and I have two wives. Right? Uh, look at them, whichever one pleases you the, the, the most, right? Uh, this is the kind of sacrifice I was prepared to make. So this shows you the, the, the kind of brotherhood that was there. But the other point, apart from, you know, we'll discuss you know, uh, the matter of the understanding of the brotherhood, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, in greater detail. But the other point that uh, I've not seen others discuss uh, is that you know, the pairing, at least in this case, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf was a skilled merchant, and he became rich in no time in Medina. He just said to his, his brother, uh, may Allah bless you in your, in your wealth and in your family. You need to give me half of your wealth, but just show me the marketplace. And he went to the marketplace, started to do business, and he became rich and he was able to marry. Right? So his, uh, the other brother did not have to divorce his wife from among them, right? They didn't want to take advantage of, of each other, etc. Uh, but why are these two rich people paired together? Right? Uh, yeah, there's a lot to be explored uh, much more. Right? So any other questions? Needs, needs a lot of research. Huh? So, uh, I mentioned, okay, at, uh, uh, and um, I don't have the names and, you know, I have a bad memory. <laughs> so the name of the answer in the case of... Um, uh, Bila, uh, sorry, uh, 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 Salman al-Farsi uh, was, who, of course, he came from outside of uh, outside of Medina also, right? Uh, but uh, he came long into Medina long before the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, before he uh, received for, for revelation and so on. 
so Salman al Farsi was there in Medina already. And so when the uh, when the Muslims were divided, uh, well, it's not divided. I don't like the term divide, right? Divide seems to be you know uh, you know separating and so on. It's not separating, but it's actually bringing them together. Uh, when they were identified as uh, Muhajirin and Ansar, uh, the Muhajirin and Ansar had <laughs> who is he? Did he belong to the uh, Muhajirin? The Muhajirin were saying yes because he came from outside of Medina. He made hijrah to Medina although this was long before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sorry, because he was living in Medina before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came. Right, so how did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam settle that? Anybody knows? How did he settle that matter? A friendly <laughs> argument. Ahlul Bayt. Salman Minna Ahlul Bayt. Ahlul Bayt, of course, the household of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, okay, uh, any... Uh, 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 so um, actually, yeah, yeah, the, the, I didn't mention the whole thing. Um, so Salma uh, da or Abu Darda probably, yes, I think it's Abu Darda. He's uh, from Medina. Uh, not necessarily. Some, all of them were not necessarily from Medina because there were others coming from outside of Medina, right? Uh, and they were, you know, pairing was done with all with the tribe of uh, Abu Darda. So he comes uh, home one day and sees uh, the mother. Uh, sorry, the wife of Abu Darda. She is distressed. Uh, you know, she's looking very worried and so on. He says. Um, What's the matter? Uh, so he asks about her welfare, and of course um, she is. Uh, you know, he, they they are. You know, for the world, for the dunya, right? Uh, so what was happening is that Abu Darda had become so what they call religious, <laughs> so religious using that in the sense that many people use it today, right? Uh, um, you like almost cut yourself off, off from the dunya and you engage in you know, religious practices in ibadah, you know, uh, up in the night and you know, doing the hajj and so on, reciting for and maybe fasting, etc., etc., right? So acts of ibadah, and he was doing that you know intensively. So Salman comes, you should take it easy. Take it easy on these matters because while you have a right uh, on yourself, your family also has a right uh, over you, right? So you have to be, be able to fulfill their, their rights. You cannot be doing this to such an extent where you neglect uh, your uh, family. And so he spends the night with him. Abu Darda during the night, Salman is observing him. I don't know if he was sleeping <laughs> but, but how, and how he did that, if he was sleeping, but he's observing Abu Darda. Abu Darda gets up uh, to pray. Salman tells him, go back to sleep. Uh, forces them to go back to sleep, right? So he goes back, <laughs> and this is of course the concern that one brother should show for the other. Right? So he goes back to him, he gets up again. Salman tells him it's still early. <laughs> he go back to sleep. Maybe I go two or three times, and, and so until eventually it is now time. But the early hours of the morning, it's coming closer, and so he said, "Okay, now it's time for what the hajj and so on to get up, to pray, and so on." Uh, so uh, uh, and then uh, Abu Darda wants to fast. And in fact, he's he offers uh, Salman food. Salman says, I'm not going to eat until you eat. He says, I'm fasting. He says, no, I'm not going to eat until you eat. <laughs> All is very fast, right? Uh, so he insists on that until Abu Darda breaks his, actually breaks his fast, right? And they eat together. Uh, so things like that, uh, that uh, really shows the understanding of what brotherhood really means. And when one is uh, having a misunderstanding, teach him and, uh, and you know, do the proper things in relation to him and so on. Abu Darda was not satisfied with all that Salman did, right? <laughs> things where you were not satisfied. Um, so he came to the Prophet said, perhaps to complain. The Salman was doing all of these things. The Prophet said, Salman is right. <laughs> Salman is right. That to cool down uh, and to fulfill his responsibilities towards his family. So, uh, any other questions? Are we close? We don't want to go too late. Right? <laughs> Jazakallah khairan. I will make Aisha downstairs on the way out. And next week is going to be online. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum.